This is Diaspora Rhythms Perspectives. I'm your host, D.E. Simmons, Executive Director. Today, we'll be getting a collector's perspective on the collecting the art of the African diaspora. Today, we'll be looking at the collection of Daniel Texador Parker. Daniel is one of the co-founders of Diaspora Rhythms and is a prolific collector and author and educator. And one of the things about Dan's collection that I love is that he has carefully curated every single piece. And when you pull back and look at this wonderful, intricate expression of our culture, it's quite humbling. So sit back. And let's get into the mindset that helped to create the Daniel Texador Parker Collection. Good afternoon, and thank you for taking some time out of your busy schedule to talk to us here at Diaspora Rhythms Perspectives. I have been wanting to interview you for quite some time. And when I heard that you were about to make a move into a new space for your collection, I said, oh, we've got to capture this before he moves it away. And, but more than that, what we wanted to capture for those who know you as an author and a collector, and for those who are being introduced to you today for the very first time, to get some insights as to how you went about creating and establishing such an extensive collection of African-American artworks. So thank you so much, Dan, for sharing this with us today. You're more than welcome. So how are you? Wonderful, thank you. Okay. So Dan, Share some insights about how you came to be the collector that you are today. Well, you know, uh, I often watch the program Finding Your Roots mm -hmm. with Lewis Gates. And time after time, uh, people on the show realize that where they are now began many, many, many years before they even were existed. Yes. So also with me. Uh, my mother was from Africa, African roots. My father was Puerto Rican. And yet many of the roots of Puerto Rican people lie in Yorba. And so my affinity for this art came from some place. Mm -hmm. And I feel that's the place. I inherited it from my parents. And so when I was young, I would uh, have this crayon set, you know, the boxes with a hundred different colors of crayon. And uh, I would draw people. And for some reason, I would always choose the dark brown to draw our people. And so that came from somewhere. That came from the people who were around me. Mm -hmm. And then I had the unique experience of having Dr. Margaret Burroughs as an instructor at DuSable High School. Wow. And Dr. Barrows <coughs> not only taught us about art and its various colors and structures and, and whatnot, but she taught us also about ourselves because DuSable was a predominantly black institution, school, high school. And she taught us that we were beautiful our hair was beautiful. Our kinky, nappy hair was beautiful. Our huge skin was beautiful. Our wide noses were beautiful. Our lips were beautiful. And in 1954, 
Dr. Burroughs or a natural. Wow. Okay. And we didn't realize then just how beautiful she was. So to answer your story, where did all of this come from? It came from my roots. Mm. And I had to grow and blossom into my roots. My roots were there and I had to grow into them. And so when I realized uh, at 21, what I had learned, I began to recognize really the beauty in myself and my people. And so I began to collect that beauty and thus this collection. What year did that start? Well, I started high school in 1959. And by, uh, I, I, I left high school in 1959. And uh, by 1960, I was looking at my roots. Um, again, going back to my mom, uh, we were poor and she would go to second-hand shops and buy uh, our furniture. And in doing so, she would also buy art. And uh, it was my job as the oldest of six to make sure that the little kids, my siblings, mm -hmm. would not damage the art. And so I then began to have an appreciation for the art. And lo and behold, I moved to the north side uh, and uh, there were all these second-hand shops, mm -hmm. which was nothing but the uh, shops that my mom would go to and in them they would have African art sometimes. And I began to know what, these art, what this art meant and uh, the people in the stores didn't know. And so I began to amass this art. Okay. And uh, as I would collect the art, I would also buy books to learn about the art. And so I began to slowly develop appreciation and a love for this art and understanding for the art. So as you've grown as a collector, what is your approach to selecting the works that you are surveying? My approach, uh, always, I, 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 I hear people say this, that I uh, initially said it, your first approach is buying what you like. You are attracted to it. Mm -hmm. It could be the color, it could be the shape, it could be the texture, whatever it is, you are attracted to that piece of art just as you are attracted to shoes, shirt, dress, whatever. You are attracted to it because of the shape, the color, and so also are paintings and statuary. So as you are attracted to it, you then go closer and you begin to look at it and you begin to see why you are attracted. Maybe it was the lines, maybe it was the breaststroke, mm -hmm. maybe it was the way the shading uh, was developed out of the painting. Be because you then begin to look at the art and see really why you enjoyed it. And in that, are you determining where it might fit in your current collection or is it an isolated experience like this I am buying, period? Where it would fit in my collection has absolutely <laughs> no concern. It's that piece of art. <laughs> that piece of art. <laughs> well, for a lot of people, they may not know um, how to navigate the art landscape in terms of, you know, buy what you like, and I understand that, but then 
what if I like the way the artist's work is done, but I'm not seeing anything that's hitting me, you know? Is that where the opportunity for commission work comes into play? And if well, so, how does that mm -hmm. it come could, about? It could. Uh, I have had work commissioned. Uh, it comes about by viewing an artist's work over a period of time, and you are attracted to his style, his or her style. Mm -hmm. And uh, once you zero in on a particular maybe piece that they have done, you may then request, I want a piece similar to this. Or it may not be similar at all. It may be something you imagine in your mind that this particular artist could produce. Okay. And in and, and general, most of the time that artists scan. Now, when, is there a value differentiation between original works versus commissioned works? Uh, no. Uh, if an artist paints an original work of art, it is valuable. Okay. If an artist paints an original work of art that you have requested of him, it is valuable. The value doesn't change. Mm -hmm. Other factors may change. The size of the work, uh, the amount of time that the artist put into the work, mm -hmm. All of these, that would be a, the di di differential between uh, the values being uh, one high or low. Now, as I look around, you have a interesting mix of representational artwork as well as indigenous uh, African art uh, sculptures how did you move along the continuum of collecting both of those? Both of those begged me to collect them. <laughs> That's how I moved to it. Uh, African art really are the holders of who I am because that's the longest art that we have on the earth and that was created by African people and that art holds deeply a part of me a part of the inspiration for me going day by day the paintings complement that art and I see it as a compliment compliment to, as a compliment to the art and to me and who I am because it can represent me now African art represents the roots of who I am. Contemporary art, the art, the paintings, and the contemporary sculptures represent who I am today. So both of them play a part in my life and my comfort and my joy. You've had an interesting journey of collecting and it's clearly not over, but there was a point where it culminated into you sitting down and documenting it in such a way that you authored a book. Could you tell us about the book and how it came about? Well, the book came about because I was moving from a space, a, a two-story space such as this, but it was 50, 400 square feet. And I felt that I could never represent my art again. And so I needed a way to record my art. 
and thus uh, African art, the diaspora beyond, came about being. And so I then began to say, let me document this art. Let me leave a story because this art deserves a story. It's, yes, part of my story, mm -hmm. but every single piece of art has its own story. And that brings about a legacy. It harkens back to 20 years ago when you guys got together and sat on that panel. What was that moment like? Well, that was an aha moment. Um, we were all talking about our art. Mm -hmm. And we were all saying the same thing, only in different ways, in our own ways. Uh -huh. And uh, that's when Herb McCoy said, oh, we should maybe form, form a group. Now, Patrick and I have had talked about having a group before mm -hmm. uh, this meeting. And this meeting was a stimulus to us uh, starting this wonderful, wonderful journey of diaspora rhythms. And so now it's been 20 years later. So what do you think about diaspora rhythms journeys and what do you think the prospects are for it going forward? Well, as with all journeys, there has been some ups and some downs, but it's been a glorious journey because our purpose was to expose the world, particularly African-American people, to the art of the diaspora, the art that originated by black people produced by black people, and that was painted by black people. And let black people know the genius that this art reveals. And so I feel that Diaspora Rhythms has really done that. But now, Diaspora Rhythms, it's time to reach another level, another plateau. Okay. And that plateau is to have a system for sustaining this art. And uh, it can be sustained by having still brick and mortar places are the concrete proof that there is an existence of something that leaves a legacy. Because while uh, digitally we do all kinds of magnificent, wonderful things, but if you do it with a concrete structure, you can invite people into that structure and then educate them. And that's what I see that Aspera Rhythms doing. Educating further, letting people know why this art is what it is and what it does. I ask everyone that I interview, especially the collectors, after they share their collections with us, I ask them, after a long day and you come home, how does your collection greet you? Well, my collection greets me with a warm hug. Uh, I can laugh with my collection. I can cry with my collection. I can curse with my collection. I can be me and my collection accepts me unconditionally. And uh, as uh, I tell many people, during our horrible uh, pandemic with coronavirus, my collection sustained me 
I didn't feel the loneliness. I, I didn't feel the desperation that many felt during that horrible period of time. Mm -hmm. Because my collection, it stayed the same. It greeted me every time I came in and while I was here. It nurtured me. And your collection can do the same thing for you. You know, it's important that emerging collectors understand that it's not a piecemeal approach, but that you're actually curating your environment to nurture you, to be your sanctuary. So with that in mind, do you have any advice that you'd like to share with an emerging collector or somebody who's deciding I want to be an artist as well as a possible collector? Because mm -hmm. we have those two. Uh, certainly. Uh, for a long time, we would discourage people from buying posters and whatnot. I would say, if your finances doesn't permit you to pay a thousand dollars for a painting, get a poster. Because then you get a feel for the art. And you can move from this poster to an original work and see the value in original work. And as I said earlier, yes, buy what you like. Just as you bought that dress, those pair of shoes, that shirt, that tie, you were attracted to it. But there's one difference in art. Many times you buy clothes because it's popular. Mm -hmm. It has a brand name. With art, you don't have to worry about a brand name. You only have to worry about what you like. And that makes a world of difference. And so as you go perhaps from a poster to original work of art, you are then beginning to curate your, your collection and build your own environment of your culture and who you are. Yeah, I think that's where most of us did start, you know, because uh, we didn't grow up, at least I didn't grow up knowing artists. And mm -hmm. being a part of Diaspora Rhythms, I have met the most wonderful artists uh, here in Chicago and places where we've traveled. Absolutely. The uniqueness of being able to call yourself a collector is new still. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it's taking on some different dimensions because uh, there's some very high end wealthy people buying art and driving up price points. So there's a wide spectrum that is evolving. And we just also saw um, some insights at the Chicago Expo where all these galleries from all around the world are featuring representational art of our people. Does what we do as collector have any impact on that landscape? Uh, we help to paint that landscape. We help to create that lands landscape. It was not exist without our input and what we did, yes, uh, very much so. Because we are saying that this artist from the south side of Chicago, who the world has never paid any attention to, mm -hmm. we are paying attention to, we are buying, we are purchasing, we are making that artist known, that artist will appear in Indiana and Michigan and Ohio and all around the world soon. We help to make artists, artists. And through those exhibitions that we've hosted, have helped to drive that awareness as well. Yes, because uh, as you mentioned, we are 
celebrating 20 years. And this 20 year experience of being in and creating and nurturing and forming diaspora rhythms is going to culminate, culminate with an exhibition at the uh, pier. And it will be made up of artwork from members of diaspora rhythms. And so this artist on the south side of Chicago, maybe that nobody in, on the north side of Chicago or in Wisconsin or in Michigan or in California has never heard of, will see her work yes. at Navy Pier. And that individual may look at it and say, wow, who is that artist? And for our community, they get to come and see themselves being represented the way I think they expect to be seen. Exactly. Respectfully. Yes. You know? Yes. And I think that's one of the beautiful benefits of, of what I think Diaspora Brothers brings to the landscape. Absolutely. <clears throat> I want to ask you a very uncomfortable question. Because you've lived through this. <laughs> but I ask everybody anyway. So the house is on fire. <laughs> what piece do you grab? Well, you know that's <laughs> like act, asking a mother who has f five children, which, which child did you grab? Um, I really can't answer that. Yeah. I will probably grab the one that's closest to the door where I'm running out of <laughs> so that we both can make it safe. Yes, I'm leave not leaving here. empty handed, yes, right? Yes, yes. And do you have a favorite piece? Uh, or a signature piece that you would spot that this signifies my collection? Uh, yeah, probably uh, the piece by. Uh, uh, Martha Wade is uh, the piece that's more most endear to me. Mm. The little girl? The little girl. Okay. All right. Well, we're going to stop here and uh, we're going to take a walk with you and let you share with us your collection. Okay. All right. That's Thank you, Dan. You're welcome. It was a pleasure. Thank mm -hmm. you.